Hi guys, welcome back to Title Gardens. So this video is going to be the next installment about this tank behind me. This tank has gone through its fair share of trials and tribulations. I believe that a couple of videos ago, it went through its ugly phase, which is kind of a new tank syndrome sort of situation where a lot of hair algae takes root. And it pretty much covered every flat surface of this entire system. Because in large part, the, the newness of the system plus essentially brand new rock fueling algae growth can have things spiral out of control really, really quickly. Now, if you've done this before, you know that the ugly phase really is more bark than bite because it goes away pretty quickly if you just handle it a couple of things. This tank now, I would say is... 85% clean. There's a lot less algae going on. There's almost no hair algae whatsoever. The herbivores, especially the snails, have done a great job. And we've gone through and managed the water chemistry of this whole system better. When we first set the system up, even when it was at its absolute heaviest hair algae growth level, there was pretty much zero nitrate and zero phosphate. And I hate seeing that because really that is more indicative of an immature system rather than you having things all under control. I would much, much, much rather see just a little bit of nitrate and phosphate in there and then for us to demonstrate our ability just to hold those levels steady. That is going to be a lot more indicative of long-term success rather than a short period of zero phosphates and nitrates and you thinking that it's all good chances are it is still the system figuring itself out. The problem with that is that once you start to pick up on phosphates and nitrates, things can go absolutely crazy. In this tank, what I was doing was a little bit of very proactive scraping and siphoning. So I was removing a lot of that hair algae by hand. I was scrubbing it with a toothbrush and siphoning at the same time, in essence removing a lot of biomass. A lot of that phosphate and nitrate was getting bound up in that algae and by me removing that as a source it was cleaning the water but at the same time it was destabilizing the system's ability to process that nitrate and phosphate. But if you just stick with it the whole thing kind of like evens out. So right now, I think that we're in like the low teens as far as nitrate goes. And we now have a very stable phosphate level of 0 0.06, I think, was the last time that we took a measurement. Just being able to maintain those levels has done like wonders, I think, for the rest of this aquarium. Because there's practically no more major problematic algae. I still see a little bit in here. I, I still see just a tiny little bit of cyano. Strangely, it's mainly on snail shells. Every now and again, we grab up some snails, toothbrush off their shells, put them back in. The whole goal behind kind of actively getting there and scrubbing was just to get it to a stage where the herbivores themselves, meaning the fish, the snails and whatnot, could trend the entire tank in the right direction. And then over time, they would pretty much handle it. And that's more or less what's happened now. It's been a couple of weeks. I mean, I could get in there and scrub a little bit more. It's practically no point. At this rate, it's going to get there on its own. Now, the fun part of this system is we finally gone ahead and started planting more SPS. A couple of weeks ago, we put in some tester colonies just in case that hair algae comes back with a vengeance. I didn't want to have a bunch of really expensive colonies in there all of a sudden just get overwhelmed by hair algae because weird stuff can happen. I wasn't expecting a huge hair algae outbreak, but nobody expects a Spanish Inquisition, so to speak. But now that we're confident that the algae situation is more or less handled, we started to plant a lot more. We've included one colony of like a raspberry shortcake. We've planted a couple of Montipora lower in the water column. We have a beach bum, a hypernova, one of like the, they're kind of like the fancy uh, Montipora. We threw in a couple of other staghorns in there. This tank is going to look barren for a little while as we wait for a lot of these things to grow. 
a lot of like the really, really, really crazy acros that we have here, unfortunately, are still very nascent. They're very small, either frags or colonies. We want to wait until we get some of those grown out before we start just plugging it all into this tank. I'm excited. I think that this, this tank could easily hold a hundred more different types, easily. When it comes to placing a lot of this stuff, we were very conscious of which ones like higher light versus which ones don't really care so much. So for example, Walt Disney's and Homewreckers, they really do like to take in a lot of light. So we've kind of positioned them more or less directly underneath these radions and also to avoid any kind of center brace because that center brace over time, I mean, we don't really notice it too much just looking at it, but there's gonna be a little bit of salt creep on the underside that's gonna block out more light. Kind of dodging the center braces and try to get it underneath a couple of the radion fixtures as much as possible is what we were going for. When it comes to planting permanent, permanent locations for a lot of these acros in this tank, we have to kind of anticipate future growth. And so it may look like these things are like super sparse, but given like a couple of months, they're going to start growing a lot. And I really didn't want to run into a situation where these colonies just started out too close and now we have to separate them out. I'd much rather give each one a lot of room to grow and a lot of room to breathe. That kind of ties into the idea of this aquascape. I wanted a lot of like open ring type formations. Even as like these large rings, they start to grow in, there's still enough room through the centers for all the fish to swim in and around. So that's kind of like why you have all these like looping concentric ring structures. I wanted to provide something that over time wouldn't clog up so much. A lot of times I think that when we have like these big, thick, monolithic aquascapes, once the corals grow in, it just becomes like this super stagnant interior core of aquascape. Whereas this, I think to some degree it will clog as obviously the colonies grow but not to the same extent. At least that's the idea. We will see one way or another. Any other things uh, of note? One thing, I'm on the fence when it comes to sea urchins. We've got a couple of like the black spiny urchins. We've got a couple of kind of like tan colored pin cushions. And I really like how urchins can really scrub down into coralline and break that up. The thing I don't like about especially the pincushion sea urchins, is that they'll grab snails and just like carry them around. These are Astrea snails and they have a hard time flipping themselves over. And by hard time, I mean they basically just die in place because this copper band is more than happy just to eat a flipped over snail. Unfortunately, like I'm looking at a pincushion right now and it has six, six snail shells on his back. In the future, I probably wouldn't have pin cushions in this tank, but for right now, the, the algae control benefits, they're kind of nice. The other thing that we've been doing lately with this tank is running some ultraviolet. I was hoping to get a bigger ultraviolet unit installed. I have a 40 watt unit. This is a 2,500 gallon system. This tank is about 600, but the entire system together with the four grow out tanks, with the large 500 gallon sump, plus the other 250 gallon show tank, it comes out to, let's say 2,500 gallons. A 40 watt UV unit shouldn't really do a whole heck of a lot. But to be perfectly honest, I think it has. I've noticed a pretty big difference. Like this tank got a lot clearer. A lot of it's a little, the little floaty bits and stuff over the course of like about a week and a half started to subside. Now, is it because of the UV? Maybe, because the other thing that we've done is we've started to hook up some activated carbon and we have one of those Bat Boy six cup units and six cups of carbon also is probably undersized for a system of this volume. But that I also think has made a big difference because when we take out a scoop of water to do anything, whether it's like dipping, cutting, whatever, we can see the tinge of that water. And because our workstation has like a white bottom, you can really see if the water is clear or whether it has like a yellow cast. Over the, the different days of running activated carbon, it's definitely cut down on that yellowness. And I think that between those two things, it's done a lot of good to clear up this water. I'm, I'm super happy to see that. Now, in the future, 
we might be going a lot more heavy when it comes to the ultraviolet. So for example, I just picked up this guy. This is an 80 watt Pentair unit. And we're just waiting on some, some fittings up top here to, to plumb all this in a lot more easily. We were even thinking about daisy chaining two of these together. But what I think is going to end up happening is it might not even end up on this system at all. We have uh, another one of these. Like I said, we're thinking about daisy chaining two together. And I installed this one on one of our frag systems that was clearly cloudy from like a you know, bacterial bloom, new tank, whatever. Pretty much within 48 hours, it's cleared that tank up. I was thinking maybe we would run just this rather than the 40 watt, but we also have a friend that works in like municipal water treatment. And he knows a ton about commercial UV systems. And he pretty much said, yeah, we don't really deal too much with Pentair when it comes to that. It's not really, um, it, it's a huge company, but it's not a huge company in that space. And so he was describing like the units that they use and they install quite a lot. And it sounds like a spaceship. Like he was talking about how like theirs can monitor the intensity of the light that's in their UV unit. So there's two things that kind of cut down on the effectiveness of, of UV. One is like the quartz sleeve that houses the UV bulb getting dirty over time. The second thing is the bulb life itself every six months or so really needs to be replaced for like maximum efficiency and maximum efficacy. So those two things. Well their units actually have a meter that can tell you when to get these things serviced. Speaking of service, they have like an automated uh, quartz sleeve cleaner. So like every day or every couple times a day, it'll actually scrub through the quartz sleeve. So I'm thinking, we don't have anything like that in the hobby, not that I know of. So why don't you go ahead and give me a quote on those? Because maybe I'll run one of those on each of these two really, really big systems. And then these 80 watt units, I'll find another home for in the greenhouse or something like that. We'll see what the, the, the quote comes back at. If it's like five figures, maybe not so much. I'm hopeful, right? The other thing that I'm thinking about doing, again, I keep on bouncing to this, is ozone. I happened to catch uh, Reef Dudes' live stream a couple days ago where uh, he had the folks on from uh, Poseidon or Ozotech and I think they make the Poseidon uh, ozone generators and I was just in chat and I got a couple of my uh, my nagging questions answered about ozone once we have a little bit more free time I think I want to experiment with it because I really love the effect of the activated carbon that we're using I mean I ordered like several five gallon buckets of rocks carbon and I just told the guys, like, let's just aggressively go through this. Let's just blow through it. I don't really care. I want to see what this does. And sure enough, water looks clear. We have like the, the volume here where it might make sense to go with an ozone unit for water clarity. I mean, not so much for sterilization or anything like that. The concentrations of ozone that you would need to actually sterilize anything, it's not really done in, in home aquariums at all. But if we're just talking about water clarity and to make it a much lower maintenance thing than actually setting up activated carbon reactors and blowing through the amount of activated carbon that we do, it might actually make financial sense after a while. Again, the only thing that's really stopping me from jumping into ozone hard is that I've just never used it before. And the cost of my implementation might be a little bit more than most because the amount of water volume that we have in all of our buildings, it leads to really high humidity. We're talking about an average of 50 to 60% relative humidity in the air. That's not gonna be super ideal for ozone because the humidity in the air should be closer to like 30% or under. Yeah, we don't get that here. This is like, this is Ohio. It is always humid, it is always rainy, it is always swampy because of all these aquariums. So I'm gonna to have to get a drier system of some sort. It'll be a little bit more expensive for me to hop into, but again, it has me curious. It definitely has me curious. All right guys, that pretty much does it for this quick update. This system is going well, and I'm really curious to see how it's going to look in the next few weeks, in the next few months. 
especially when it comes to these colonies growing in. So what I'm going to do is take a whole bunch of macro shots for you guys, and then we'll come back and see how this is growing in. All right, guys, that's all from here. See you guys next time.